the little boy had gone to church with his parents. And when the offering plate was passed around, his father gave the son the money to put in the plate when it went by. <clears throat> it was only five dollars, but when the plate got to the little boy, he didn't put it in the plate. And so after church, the little boy walked up to the preacher and gave him the five dollars. And the preacher was curious. He said, son, why didn't you put it in the offering plate when the offering plate came by? He said, my, my folks told me that you was a pretty poor preacher, and so I thought you needed the money. <laughs> I knew if I waited long enough, somebody would say something. <laughs> talking about the prodigal son. <clears throat> we introduced him about three weeks ago. Prodigal son that never left home. But Jesus was talking, as Roger said, in the first couple of verses of Luke 15, and he's talking to the sinners and tax collectors. Matter of fact, he's teaching them and breaking bread with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes are criticizing Jesus for doing that. He, they say, if you are who you say you are, why are you hanging around with the low life and reprobates of this world? So Jesus tells them this parable about themselves. He also is talking to the scribes and Pharisees who are sitting around with him. <laughs> and by the way, before we start pointing fingers, we all have both of these groups in us. We have the sinners and tax collectors group, and we have the scribes and the Pharisees in us as well. <laughs> now, three weeks ago, we broke out the appetizers. And <laughs> we, we learned about the reflections of the sun, his respectability. He was looked up to because he was the oldest son. And along with that came respectability. He was to inherit all of his father's inheritance when his father passed away. His younger son had already gotten his and went off to some parts unknown. And so everything that was his father's was going to be his. Along with that responsibility came the legal and religious responsibility of that family as well. We looked at his labor in verse 25. He worked for his father. It's the only job he ever had. If you ask anybody that lived around that neighborhood, they said he was a well-rounded young man. He worked hard for his father. And verse 29a, we looked at his loyalty. He was loyal to his family, to his community. <laughs> Never drug their name through the mud. Very good. As a matter of fact, <laughs> We'd love to have a child like that. We'd love to have a child that was obedient, never disrespectful. We also learned that there's more to serving the Lord than just being busy with the things of the Lord. And this boy was busy about his father's business. Busy about his father's things. <laughs> he looked good on the outside. But there was trouble in River City on the inside. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we got the entree, the meat and the potatoes of the message, the resentment of the sun. We learned that what was festering on the inside of this boy was about to boil over to the outside. <laughs> The true nature of this child was about to be revealed. In verses 25b and 26, the eldest boy was suspicious. He came home from the field working hard. He sees the lights on in the house and music coming from the house. So he asked the servant, what's going on? And the servant says, your brother's back. And they're throwing him a big party. 
Why do you even kill a fatted calf in his honor? That was a straw that broke the camel's back. Because in verse 28, we find this boy is jealous. His brother was gone. His brother was dead as far as he was concerned. He had all of his father's attention. And now he's back. Verse 28, he was jealous. In verse 28b, he was rebellious. He refused to go into the party. He refused to celebrate this joyous occasion. Verse 29 and 30, he was contentious. He was argumentative with his father. He says, you never threw me a party. You never killed a fatted calf for me. But this son of yours comes back. And you throw a great big party. See, he said, son of yours. He said that because his brother was dead to him. He had no use for him, and he wasn't going in to celebrate, and he returned. And then we save the best for last. This is called the dessert portion of our message. It's all about the Father. And verse 28c, you can write down, if you're writing in your Bibles, compassionate response. <coughs> compassionate response. It says, therefore came his father out and entreated him. What that simply means is he went out to see his boy to see if he could make things well. He knew his brother, his son was upset. He knew he didn't like his brother. He probably threw a fit when his dad gave him his portion of his inheritance. There was no love lost between the two of them. Our Heavenly Father has <coughs> compassion on us, his children. And this is a picture, this parable is a picture, and the Father is a picture of our Father in Heaven. This boy was rebellious and he wouldn't go in. So the Father came out and entreated him. He tried to reason with him, talk some sense into the boy. The son wouldn't go in, so the father came out. And that's the way it is with our Heavenly Father. He comes to us, <clears throat> tries to reason with us. But we're pretty thick headed, aren't we? <laughs> we're pretty stubborn. Just like the oldest boy in this story. His father, like our father, is rich in mercy. In Ephesians 2, 4 it says, But God, being rich in mercy, that's compassion, because of his great love with which he loved us. In Lamentation 3, 22 and 23, I love what this says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Woo! Woo! Some mighty powerful words. And our Father loves us just like that. God loves each and every one of us. He has no specials, no favorites. We're all loved equally and the same. There's a story about a young man, his name was Jim. <clears throat> At 10 years old, Jim had given his life to the Lord. He had dedicated himself to the Lord. <clears throat> but now at 25, some 15 years later, he had forgotten about that commitment. Jim had adopted a live for the moment 
attitude. Get what you can while you can. Philosophy. But with that philosophy came some bad habits. <laughs> Jim started having trouble in the workplace. Three of his relatives died simultaneously. Fear and doubt <clears throat> crept into Jim's mind and heart. He didn't know where to turn. He didn't know what to do. And he got thinking back. I once knew the Lord. So he got his Bible down, blew the dust off of it, and he turned to Psalm 121 in verse 2. Don't turn there, I'll read it. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Jim rededicated his life to the Lord. And God was waiting there for him with open arms. Welcome back, Jim. Welcome back. The nation Israel was favored by God. Chosen people. And yet they wandered away. They rebelled and turned away from his goodness. They went down their own paths. And by the way, God will let you do that. God will let you go wander off. I got this, Lord. I know exactly where I'm going. I'll talk to you later. We've been here and done that, haven't we? But you know when your path runs out and you can't go any further, when you turn around to head back, guess who you meet? Guess who you meet? God. He never leaves us, nor forsakes us. I love the song. It goes, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling Calling for you and for me. See on the portal, he's waiting and watching. He's watching for you and for me. God's watching and he's waiting. Just like he was with Jim. Our Heavenly Father responds to us in this same way. When we're lost, he looks for us. When we're hurting, he comforts us. When we're discouraged, he encourages us through his word. Secondly, it was a competent response the Father gave him in verse 31. The New Message Bible, I'm going to read from that. So if you want to write next to the verse 31, write down competent response. It says, the Father said, son, you don't understand. You are with me all the time, and everything that I have is yours. Everything is yours. This boy didn't appreciate what he had. The father was trying to remind his son, and the definition of remind is make somebody aware of something they may have forgotten. And this boy had forgotten what he had. He couldn't see for the anger and resentment he felt for his brother. He couldn't feel joy and happiness. He had taken his eyes off of his father's love. The oldest boy could only see contempt that he had for his brother. Our Heavenly Father has to remind us from time to time to focus on Him. A few weeks back I said, told you a little story about taking your eyes off of your problems and putting them on Jesus. I gave the illustration of the disciples were in a boat with Jesus and they were crossing the lake and the storm came up. 
And they were panicking. Oh, we're going to die. We're going to die. Jesus was right there in the boat. Right there in the boat. And they didn't even think to wake him up. They didn't even think to ask him for help. They were so focused on the storm. And we do that with our lives. Something comes along. Satan will put something in your way to get your eyes off of the Lord and focus on the problem. You need to tell Satan, bug off. Bug off. I don't know if that's scriptural. <clears throat> bug off, but hey. <laughs> I like what Hebrews 13, 5 says. Let your conduct be without covetedness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, that's God, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Had the oldest son had read that verse, he wouldn't have had issues with his feelings for his oldest brother or younger brother. He couldn't see the forest for the trees. How many of you have heard that say? <laughs> his con condition and his feelings for his brother blocked everything out. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. God loves us and he only knows one way to love. That's what all, of he, all that he has, all of his heart, and that's a universe-sized heart, full of love. Thirdly, now with this I'll quit. A compelling response. Right next to verse 32, a compelling response. Verse 32 says, It was meant that we should make merry, and be glad for this, thy brother was dead and now is alive. He was lost and now he is found. The father is telling his son that this party was necessary. It was important to have a celebration, to make merry. For his brother was, and that's what he said. Did you read that? And this, thy brother, remember when he said, your son had come back? He had disowned his brother. His father reminds him. His father reminds him. He says, for this thy brother. Isn't that great? God reminds us of who people are. This thy brother was dead and is alive, was lost, and now he's found. He's your brother! In Luke 15, 7, the New English Translation says, I tell you, in the same way, there, are, there will be more joy in heaven for one sinner who repents than for 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. This celebration had to happen. Every time a sinner gets saved, there's a celebration in heaven. This boy had come home, and he was going to be celebrated. The father had cause for celebration. His joy knew no bounds. He's our heavenly father as well. We may not understand all that God is doing in our lives. <laughs> this oldest son didn't understand what was going on. But it is necessary. But it is necessary. God has a plan. And that plan will come regardless of what we do or what we say. It will happen. This boy didn't want it to happen. He wanted things his way. His way or the highway. Our mission on this earth 
is to serve the Lord. Is to serve the Lord. I believe the Father was telling his son that the celebration was the right thing to do. And that he had a choice to make, the oldest son. He could come in and join the party. Or he could remain outside, too full of his pride, to eat of the fatted calf. And isn't it interesting that this parable closes without an ending? It doesn't tell us what the oldest son decided to do. See, I believe God left it that way for a reason. I believe we are to put ourselves in the place of the oldest son. He had a choice to make. A decision had to be made. We have that same choice. We have that same decision. We are to write our own ending to this story. The Lord is talking to us today. He's telling us, you have to decide. You have to decide. We are all, we all have received an engraved invitation to the celebration. The invitation is engraved in each and every one of our hearts. Each one of us has an engraved invitation. RSVP, we need to reply. I like what Revelation 20, uh, 30, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come in with him and I will dine with him and him with me. Jesus is waiting for the answer. And if you're going to go into the celebration, then we need to open that door and invite Jesus in. Yes, Jesus, I want to go to that celebration. I want to go to that party. But by not answering the door, but by ignoring that knock on the door, we are telling our Father in heaven, no thanks. No thanks. I don't want any part of that. I don't want anything to do with you. <coughs> we have a choice. We have a choice to make. Will we choose to go in, or will we choose to stay out? Will we choose to go up, or will we choose to go down? The invitation was sent to our hearts. The invitation was sent to our hearts. Because the answer to that invitation has to come from your heart. You have to dig. Ask yourself. Where do I want to spend the rest of my life? When God comes back, if he came back tomorrow, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. And I hope all of you here can say that same thing confidently, without question or doubt. <clears throat> I know where I'm going. Now the song I'm going to sing is about <laughs> that boy named Jim I told you about. <clears throat>
It's about a girl. She once knew the Lord. She blew the dust from the cover of her Bible on the shelf. She placed it there herself some years ago. But with trembling hands, she slowly turned the pages. She slowly turned the pages of God's Word, but ain't it amazing, isn't it grand, ain't it amazing, God can love us where we stand. Her fingers came to rest at Psalm 51. She read the words there on the page and realized what she'd done. And as the tears fell on her Bible, Lord, she bowed her head and cried. Said, I'm sorry. Thank God. 
Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I have not lived my life according to thy word. And I do open that door, Lord, to my heart. I hear you knocking this morning. And I want you to come into my life. I want you to forgive me of my sins, Lord, and take me to heaven when I die. Now, if you said that prayer, see me after church. I have a Bible I want to give you. To get you started on the right path, you need to be fed. God's Word is better than bread. Father, we thank you for the service this morning. Thank you for the message of the prodigal son who never left home. It has touched my heart this morning. And I pray, Lord, that somebody in here will come to know you or be encouraged by that message this morning. We thank you, Father, for your Son, for all that you have done for us. Your marvelous, wonderful grace, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.